Welcome to At The Movies. So glad that you all are here. And uh, some of you were here last week and you decided to come back this week, so high five. Some of you are new this week, so high five. We're glad that you're here. And then we've got people that are joined with us online. The Millers were gracious enough to bring movie snacks and they're back there on the uh, table. Uh, what do y'all have back there? Y'all have Chex Mix. Chex Mix. All right. So three different kinds. So if you want some snacks, go back there and do that graciously. Thank y'all for, for bringing that today. So at the tables where you are, we've got some things we want you to do. Uh, yeah, there you go. At your table, I want you to share your name. And even if you know each other, share your name anyway. What service do you attend if you go to any? And if you don't, that's cool. And have, how have you seen or where have you seen God at work the last seven days? So before you go into that, as Christians, we're called to be on the lookout for what God is doing. It's not a matter of if He is doing anything, but what is He doing that we have eyes to see. Okay? Go. Go. Here's your two minute warning. Hopefully you got to meet some people you haven't met before and share a little God stories. I, I think those are cool conversations to have. And if you are in another small group or with other people or even in a Sunday school class, throw a wrench into things every once in a while. And instead of focusing on what you want to focus on, throw something out there like where have you seen God at work over the last 24 hours or the last seven days and see how it changes the tone of the conversation. We're good at talking around God. But this actually gets you start talking about God. So you might just take that as a challenge to do that. So here's another challenge. I need someone to volunteer to open us up in prayer. And for those of you who haven't been with me before, avoiding eye contact does not get you off the hook. 
<laughs> in fact, it draws more attention to you. So, in grace, as Christians, we're all called to be pray, uh, read prayers, and it's not about the number of words or your eloquence. Your prayer, as I've said before, is like macaroni art to your Father in Heaven. No one else may see the artwork in that, but your Papa loves it. So, who wants to open us up in prayer? Charles. Awesome. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we are, first of all, humble in your presence, and we praise your holy name. We're grateful that you placed us here to be a part of your world, and we hope that uh, we would uh, be able to grow in the uh, likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we're asking for that guidance. We're hoping that as we come to these uh, Bible studies that we would be growing in that process and that we would be making strides in that way. Open our hearts to your truth and your light. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, you, Thank, you, Thank you, Charles. Excellent. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, hey, Susan. How are you? Uh, so tonight we are going to watch Gran Torino. How many of you have seen Gran Torino? Yeah. Did it help getting the information really early Tuesday morning, not Monday when I, I was supposed to send it? Got Tuesday morning. Did anyone have a chance to watch the movie? I know that wasn't much time. Uh, well, here's what here's all you need to know. Clint Eastwood. That's all you need to know. So you'll you'll, you'll pick up on it. So uh, Grant Torino, the summary of the movie is he's a disgruntled Korean War veteran, Walt Kowalski, and he sets out to reform his neighbor. Uh, a Hmong teenager who tried to steal his prized possession, a 1972 Grand Torino. Anyone in the room know what a Grand Torino was, is or knew what it was when back then day? Did anyone have a 1972 Grand Torino? I didn't have a Grand Torino, but I had a Torino. <laughs> oh, is there is one bigger than the other? I mean, I don't know. It's just like cars, just off Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Because in the movie, it's a pretty sweet car, but that's not going to be the focus of what we do tonight. So. Uh, Walt is a recent widower and has no real relationship with his kids. Uh, religion is a crush to him, and Walt, but through the movie, Walt finds redemption. Now, the movie is about two hours long. Uh, we ain't watching the whole movie, okay? We want you to, to go back and do that. But there are going to be three clips that I want us to focus on today. And they're, they're relatively short clips. And at the end of each clip, I'm going to ask you what stands out to you. Because I want to hear that, how, what just stands out to you about the scene? What are the things that stand out to you? Because at the end, we're going to do some, uh, some Bible flipping. and I'm going to share with you what stands out to me on that. Okay, anybody have any questions about anything so far? Has anyone ever thought that Clint Eastwood would help you draw closer to Jesus? <laughs> Maybe not. So, we'll see. So, so the first clip is actually the, the very first scene in the movie. And uh, we're using Netflix, so... Uh, hopefully it'll work out here in just a second. Okay, yeah, y'all give attention to the screen. I'll turn off the light. Sorry about Dorothy Wall. She was a real peach. Thanks for coming out. Now that's 
time we stopped doing Thanksgiving. You know, that deal with the boat motor, the broken bird bath, it's always something. What are you gonna do with him? You know, don't you think he's gonna get in trouble over there? All by himself in the old neighborhood? Why don't you have him move in with you? Death is often a bittersweet occasion to us Catholics. Bitter in the pain, sweet in the salvation. Bitter in the pain it causes the deceased and their families. Sweet for those of us who know the salvation that awaits. And some may ask, what is death? Is it the end? Or is it the beginning? And what is life? What is this thing we call life? All of these questions can frustrate you at times like this. And that's why you have to turn to the Lord. Jesus. Because the Lord is the sweetness. Okay. So we'll pause it there. So uh, let me turn on the lights. So what, what were some things that stood out to you in that scene? There you go. What were some things that stood out to you in that scene? Uh, disrespect. In what way? Uh, the, the kids, for one thing, just, you know, they weren't really... Uh, Same way it is today. Yeah, they, they didn't care what was going on. D disrespect of the... Of the, of the process. Of the the disrespect of the process. Their grandmother had just died. Disrespect of yeah. their grandfather. Disrespect of just the religious piece of it, right? Also, when the, uh, when the priests started speaking, it appeared that there were a lot of people who just, you know, they were off somewhere else. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, what else did that tell you? A lot of judgmentalism going on. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by that, Brad? Judgmentalism. Well, everybody's doing judgmental stuff to everybody else. It's okay. The, the, the uh, Clint Eastwood's judging everything. The kids are judging people. The, Sons, I assume that's their sons. Uh huh. They are. So everybody's just being more judgmental. Yeah. What What else did I tell you? Their sons don't like their daddy. Sons don't like their daddy. Yeah. How many How many of you feel sympathy towards Clint Eastwood, his character so far? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of us, uh, we may have been in the position of the kids who are trying to wonder what to do with the parents. Some of us uh, may have identified with Clint Eastwood with kids who aren't stepping up to the plate in some way, right? So, th so that's a very identifiable scene for a lot of people, right? For me, I'm, in the scenes that you're going to see, uh, look, your, your pastor picked them. So the, most of the scenes have to deal with Clint Eastwood and the, the priest. Uh, Clint Eastwood's a son of a gun. I'm just going to tell you. We're going to learn more about him in just a little bit. So on one level, he's, there is a sympathetic piece to him. But I, just from a generational standpoint, uh, I think he, as you hear his story, he is just as disrespectful as the kids. Yeah, and, and so I, and, that, and, and in church world, let, let's, all, let's all take this with a grain of salt. We can always look at the generations behind us and go, they're not respectful, but uh, it, it kind of starts from the top. And his boys learn that by watching their daddy yeah. and those kids learned it from watching their parents so it's, it's not it's not just a I mean it's not all the parents fault I mean they train the kids up in the way that they should go right and they'll not stray far from it and uh, raising kids it's hard y'all you know y'all may have heard that before so you know we, we understand that but Clint Eastwood that old man there is being just as disrespectful as everyone else in that group it, generations don't get a free pass on that all right, so the second clip is one where uh, the priest is coming to talk with Clint Eastwood, and he doesn't have, uh, Clint Eastwood doesn't have a lot of respect for the priest because in a previous scene, he calls him a 27 year old virgin right out of seminary who doesn't know anything about life. 
Sometimes we hear that as pastors. Okay, so uh, something's happened in the neighborhood where Clint Eastwood has confronted uh, a gang and uh, the pastor, the priest, has been working with the folks. Can you rewind it just a little bit further, Amy? Just a little bit. Can you rewind it just a little bit, like 10 seconds? Just hit that 10 second circle right down here. Right here. Right here. There you go. Once. That's okay. Twice. And we'll see if it goes back any further. There you go. That's perfect. And uh, that's okay. Just leave it where it is. I think that's. Just go ahead and push play. Yeah, here's the priest. He's coming up. Good afternoon, all. I told you I'm not going to confession. Why didn't you just call the police? What? I do work with some of the Mon gangs, and I heard there was some trouble in the neighborhood. Why didn't you call the police? Well, you know, I, I prayed that they would show up, but... Nobody answered. What were you thinking? Someone could have been killed. We're talking life and death here. Things go wrong, you gotta act quickly. When we were in Korea and a, a thousand screaming gooks came across our line, we didn't call the police. We reacted. We're not in Korea, Mr. Kowalski. I've been thinking about our conversation on life and death. About what you said. About how you carry around all the horrible things you were forced to do. Horrible things that won't leave you. It seems it would do you good to unload some of that burden. Things done during war are terrible. Being ordered to kill, killing to save yourself, killing to save others. You're right. Those are things I know nothing about. But I do know about forgiveness. And I've seen a lot of men who have confessed their sins, admitted their guilt, and left their burdens behind them. Stronger men than you. Men at war who were ordered to do appalling things and are now at peace. Well, I gotta get it to you, Padre. Came here with your guns loaded this time. Thank you. And you're right about one thing. About stronger men than me reaching their salvation. <coughs> well, hell of fucking Louis. But you're wrong about something else. What's that, Mr. Crosby? The thing that haunts a man the most is what he is in order to do. Okay. Uh, by the way, there's some strong language. Sorry, I forgot to tell you on that. So, uh, what stood out to you about that, about that scene? The fact that the priest came uh, with a stronger voice talking directly to Clint. Yeah. And addressing him with the issues. Yeah. I, I found as a pastor, uh, just like with anybody, as you talk with folks, you got to know who you're talking to. And some people will not respond to subtlety and uh, beating around the, uh, the bush about it. Uh, people, some people need to just be told straight up to speak their language because that's how they speak. And Clint Eastwood was someone who just kind of laid it out there. So he is more respectful to someone who does the same thing. So uh, priests, pastors, uh, hey, we get, we get to be pastor of all y'all. So we get to talk, think about different ways to communicate. So what else stands out to you? Well, it's obvious that uh, Walt uh, had baggage from his experience in Korea. Uh -huh. And that has a big influence on the way he is now. That's right. Yeah, that's, and the, uh, so this movie was made in 2008. Korean War was mid-50s. Mm -hmm. well, I know what. <laughs> yeah. But for, for those who, do, who don't, that's a lot of time to be carrying mm -hmm. a lot of baggage on that. Okay, what else did that tell you? It seemed like Walt was starting to open up more to the priest. Mm -hmm. he had the past. He just, previously, he just kind of made blunt statements and Mm -hmm. explained or anything or talked in detail. Here he was more willing to do that. Yeah, Walt seems to be more open to the priest. And I think part of that is because the priest is meeting him on his turf, addressing an issue and using a little bit more stronger voice. Uh, pa pastors, and I think uh, uh, 
this reputation is justified sometimes. Uh, and I kind of had the same judgment of pastors when I was growing up before I felt the call to be a pastor, which I didn't want, but God gave it to me anyway, that I, I thought pastors were pastors because they couldn't do anything else. <laughs> I did. I, that's just how I grew up. So I, I didn't really think of looking to pastors for wisdom and guidance on those things. They were just there to pray super long pastoral prayers on Sunday morning and gave me time to doodle on the give offering envelope during the sermons. I mean, that was, of course, y'all have never thought that in the last two years. So that's, that's a part of it. I thought, well, also just the imagery of while he was talking, when the priest was talking to Walt, uh, the American flag was waving in the back. I mean, it's the nonverbal stuff that, that I mean, so, so Walt, on behalf of his country, was dealing with the baggage of that, while at the same time, the, the flag was represented in the back. I just thought that was yeah, did interesting. You catch, did you catch his last comment? The hallelujah one? No, yeah. the last yeah. comment that he made. Yeah, what sticks with a person is not what you're ordered to do. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that you choose to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and his hallelujah comment, he was a little bit more con uh, colorful with it. But uh, the reason I included that in there, and if it offended you, uh, okay. But the reason I included it in there is because, look, that's the way a lot of people feel. I mean, we can act like it's not, but it is. Susan, you were going to say something? Oh, well, I was just going to say, I think it, it also stands out, and he highlights the fact that he's been thinking about something that he had said in their previous conversation where we should let his guard Yeah. And I feel like the little 27-year-old pastor could have, I think all of us would have had that person, that Satan in the background saying, don't worry about it, just leave it alone. He's an old man. Just just leave him alone. Uh -huh. There's no point. There's no place. But instead, he pondered on it and he wrestled with it. Yeah. And he came back to him and he sought him out. And I just feel like that's what Jesus does to us. Uh -huh. He searches and reaches out and keeps plugging away. And every once in a while, you get through Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was modeling going to the least and the lost, and even those who didn't want to be found. You know, just kind of went out and did that. Okay, the last scene is where there's been a lot of stuff happening in the movie. Uh, he used a term earlier about uh, the, the people he was fighting. It's a, an offensive term. I won't repeat it. But through this whole movie, there's a process where uh, uh, the enemy who he fought in, in the 50s he was now surrounded by in his or people who looked like them in the neighborhood and his walls start getting broken down okay so his heart is being strangely warm that's a methodist term on that also uh, but he's he's coming to uh the priest and i want you amy go back uh 10 seconds on that scene netflix is kind of hard to pinpoint the exact location a little bit more one more time perfect and so as you watch this scene uh, listen to what uh, Clint Eastwood's I've talking about. Suit before, uh, look a bit bad. What can I do for you, Mr. Kowalski? I'm here for a confession. Oh, oh Jesus, what have you done? <laughs> Just take it easy now. What are you up to? Are you going to give me a confession or not? since your last confession? Oh, forever. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. What are your sins, my son? Well, in 1968, I kissed Betty Jablonski at the factory Christmas party. Dorothy was in the other room with the other wives. It just happened. Yes, go on. Well, I made a $900 profit selling a boat and a motor. I didn't pay the taxes. It's the same as stealing. Yes, fine. Oh, well, lastly, I was never very close with my two sons. I don't know them. I, I didn't know how. That's it? That's it. <laughs> bothered me most of my life. Say ten Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. God loves you and forgives you. I absolve you of all your sins. 
the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Brian Jerry. Are you going to retaliate for what happened to Sue? I'm going over to that house today, Mr. Kowalski. That's hell. It is. And every other day until you see the folly in what you're planning. Busy day. Gotta go. Go in peace. Oh, I am in peace. Okay. What stood out to you? What stood out to you in that scene? Mm -hmm. He didn't know how to. No, he didn't know how to. He had a father to them. Right. Yeah, how, how sad it was that he confessed about his broken relationship with his boys for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. he's trying to square everything up because of what he's about to do. Yeah, there's, there's the end of the movie, which we're not going to watch, but the, you know, there's, there's the end of the story. But the arc of at the beginning, he didn't want to have anything to do with the priest. Then there was a little bit of a breakthrough where he, and he said, I'm not going to do the confession even if you show up here. But then as he's getting everything squared away, putting things in order, he does do that ritual of coming clean mm -hmm. on that. I, th I think that's interesting. What else stood out to you? I think the, uh, the priest uh, really showed his human emotions. He wasn't very empathetic. He was almost sarcastic with him during the confession. Yeah. Like, is that it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean. That's what bothered him most. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when I when I first saw the movie and when I watched it again, I think there's a point where he did feel compelled to confess because of what he was about to do. But I also feel like he confessed enough to where he could offer a confession, but he wasn't it, it was kind of surface level stuff. Yes, there were big things, but I don't think he really plunged the depths of his soul on that. He he was doing what needed to be done. And he was following the letter of the law. I need to confess as a lapsed to practicing Catholic. Uh, but I, I, I don't know how sincere that was right. on that. So an unsincere confession. Wait. Yes. Do you think there have, may have been some push to appease the last <coughs> wishes of his wife to do the confession? Uh, the question is, do, do I think that there was an effort to kind of appease the last wishes of his wife? I, I think so. I mean, the church was important to his wife. Uh, I think it was, I think it, his view of the church was changing. However, I don't know if it changed to the point where he just felt compelled to do it for his own self. I think it was honoring his wife because his wife left a, such a void in his life. Yeah, great question. Anything else stand out to you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I kind of understand what you were saying about that he didn't really seem to have that much to confess, but I kind of got the impression and felt like he was really sincere in what he wanted to do <coughs> in confession, but he didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. he, he, but, you know, we don't know what his sure. character is thinking at the time. Yeah, so he could have been doing just what he knew to do. And uh, I understand that people's faith are kind of on a, on a spectrum here. You've got, uh, you've got spiritual uh, people who are not spiritually alive yet. Okay? It doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. It's just that they're not awakened to God doing something. Uh, as Methodists, we understand prevenient grace goes before and awakens us. Okay? And when we're born into new life, Jesus told Nicodemus, it doesn't matter how much you know, it's, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asked, do I have to enter a second time into my mother's womb? And Jesus says in John chapter 3, no, it's not about that. It's about being born of the Spirit. Okay, so that's when we, when we are baptized and profess our faith, we are born of the Spirit. So we go from someone who's spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And that means, in my understanding, that some of us walking around here are spiritual babies. We may have accepted the gift and know that we're now alive, but we're like infants that need to be cared for. We need to... And I mean this, as a when you look as a parent to the child, you care for the baby and let the baby be the baby at what stage they are with the understanding that you're going to help grow them up. So you don't, you don't tear down a baby because they need their diaper changed. You go, this is a baby who needs their diaper changed. 
but you also look forward to the day when they don't have to have their baby their diaper changed. But we've got spiritual babies. Okay? We've also got spiritual children who've gotten now the diaper stage, but they're spiritual kids and spiritual kids, yes, they are awakened to Christ. However, everything centers around them. And I've got two kids in the household, eight and nine. Susan knows what I'm talking about. Eight and nine. And I love my kids. I don't expect them to be teenagers, and they're not young adults like my older two kids, nor are they babies. They're kids, and sometimes their world revolves around themselves. Don't play with my toys. Uh, you're hurting me. You're talking too loud. Stop touching me. In church world, that's called you're sitting in my seat. It's not, it's, not, it's not working the way that I want. The, music's not, the, the music being played is not the music that I want to hear. Why aren't they playing the music that I want? That's, that's what children do. So you just love them because everybody's at a different stage. And then there's spiritual young adults who are not the children anymore, but they're spiritual teenagers. doesn't have anything to do with your physical age. But teenagers now see the wider world. And a lot of teenagers are trying to break away from being a child and being under the rule of their parents to in a wider world, but they're awkward. Okay, When I, I was sharing with, I think... Uh, it must have been Hannah or someone else recently. I can't remember who I was sharing it with. But Michelle says, I went through an Ethiopian stage when I was a teenager. I'd grown up so fast. I'd skinnied up so small. And I had really bad acne. Like super bad acne. Like had to take medicine acne on it. And those were my awkward teenage years. I was 6'8 as a sophomore. And about that big around. With pot marks all over my face and couldn't eat enough food to get going. That was my awkward years. Also awkward in trying to figure out my place in the world. Okay, so if we know that in just how we age, we also can understand that in our own spiritual walk. And then we understand that hopefully there are people who will become spiritual parents. That's regardless of age. Who will look back at the kids and the, the infants, the kids, well, I'm sorry, the spiritually dead, the infants, the kids, and the teenagers, and come alongside them as a loving parent and go, look, I love you. How can I come alongside of you and help you? How can I help you grow into maturity? One of the reasons that we have Pastor Randy coming on as our senior saints person is not to tend to the babies. It's to help to develop senior saints that are spiritual parents, to disciple them. Because we have a whole bunch of spiritual babies and infants and teenagers, or in, uh, children and teenagers, who need to be have some people come alongside them and nurture them. Okay, So we will respond to the stage that we are in. That's how I understand things as a pastor. We're not all monolithic within the sanctuary. We're all at different stages. So when we recognize that, we can just love people where they are and help grow them. So that was a really long response to what you said, Bill, but that, I think that's really where that comes from on that, at least from your pastor's perspective. All right, so here's some, th here's some things that I want us to, to look at for biblical teaching. Y'all ready? Biblical teaching, one of the things that stood out to me uh, in the first scene was at the service for his wife, uh, what an important role the faith of a spouse makes. So turn to 1 Corinthians, and once again, if you don't know where Corinthians is, uh, look at the menu on your phone, or uh, go to the table of contents in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 12 through 14. Uh, as you're looking for that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 7, uh, verses 12 through 14. Is uh, 1 Corinthians in the Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament. New Testament. Who is the author of 1 Corinthians? Paul. Who's the group of people that he's writing to? The Christians in Corinth. Okay, this is his first letter. So he's not writing a general letter to all the inhabitants of Corinth. He's writing to the Christians, the church. And when we say church, it's not the, the brick and mortar. It's the, the people who call themselves Christian. Okay, so he's instructing them on a lot of different things because that's what Paul does. He starts churches, builds up leadership, sends letters afterwards to instruct them. And this is concerning married life, and he says a lot of things in there. But then he gets to, to 12, and he says this, To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, so he's, he's being pretty clear that 
uh, he's not saying uh, he's a prophet. This is actually from the Lord. He's saying, look, this is my instruction to you based on my experience. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Now, let's slow down and look at this. If any brother, and when he says brother, he's talking about brothers in the faith. Okay? Brothers and sisters. I, in my first church, I called someone uh, uh, Sister Mary, something like that. I don't remember. I called her sister. And one of the ladies overheard me, and she came up and she goes, are you related to her? And I go, no, actually, that's a sign of endearment as a Christian body. We're brothers and sisters. But she hadn't heard that language before. So I had to be aware that that's what was going on. So, 13, And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, uh, here's some things that stand out to me about that. One, let me caveat this by going, uh, there's some relationships that are broken. Okay, There's abuse taking place. There's addiction that run rampant. There's extreme cases where... Uh, that which is meant to be holy has been dishonored. Okay, let me say that. Those are the exceptions. Okay, a lot of times husbands and wives, we just, we just get irritated with each other for less extreme reasons, okay? So what Paul is saying here in the body of Christ is he's saying that, for example, Walt here. One of the things that was really helpful for Walt was his wife, her faith... God actually used her faith to make a difference in Walt, even when Walt wasn't ready to claim faith for himself. You following me? So in a way, Walt was being sanctified through the faith of his wife, even if Walt didn't understand or want sanctification. So I feel pretty confident, I'm assuming here, that Walt's wife spent many time, uh, much time at the, at the kneeling rail in her Catholic diocese praying for her husband, Walt. And in the great expanse of eternity and time, that made a difference in Walt to get Walt to where he is today. So with all that being said, uh, if you know you or if you know of other people who are connected with a spouse who is a little bit slow getting on the faith train and is not speaking the same language and is kind of dragging their feet. And I know at our church, we have church widows and church widowers. They're couples, but you never see the spouse because they don't do the church thing. Okay? As frustrating as that is and how heartbreaking that is for that couple, there's something to be said about the faithful spouse who keeps on going and interceding on behalf of their spouse. Okay? So don't lose heart. God's grace is in there somewhere doing that. Okay? Hope is not lost. Okay? What thoughts do y'all have on that or questions? Thank you. I'm, I'm, thank you for letting me know I answered that perfectly. Okay, so the next one is Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is in the Old Testament. And Psalm 32 is a psalm of King David. Somebody tell me a little something about King David, what you know about him. He was a man after God's own heart, right? And did, did David always lead a, a moral, upright, faithful life? No. No, he was chosen by God to be the leader of God's people. But he had feet of clay. He had feet of clay. That's exactly right. So in, this, in the second episode, in the second scene, we, we see the priest come up and Walt says, oh, look, I know you're here, but I'm still not doing a confession. Mm -hmm. And then we see later in the third scene that he does confess. Uh, is there a time, any time during the week that you are exposed to, uh, you were given an opportunity to spend some time in confession? When? In church? In church? On Wednesday? Every uh, if, if, especially if you go to the traditional worship service. The traditional worship service, we incorporate a time of confession. Now, 
one of the tensions that I feel as a pastor is that we really don't spend enough time confessing. It's part of, but we, you know, we have an hour, and there's music to play, and there's a sermon to preach, and then you throw in communion on those days, and these are all time eater uppers, right? So when it comes to confession, we walk up there, and and this is just a tension we have to manage. And there's a better way, though. I know. We go up and say, hey, this is an opportunity for you to go before the Lord in prayer. In this moment of silence, please confess your sins to the Lord. We're silent for about a minute. Let's hear the, here's your prayer of confession. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now let's, let's lift up prayers of the people. It's almost like a transactional thing. We're doing it and we're going through it. And it doesn't really give us enough time to really dig into going, man, I have not loved God and others this week. Because then when you look at Psalm 32, uh, man, it's pretty, pretty powerful. Okay. Psalm 32. Let me, let me read parts of it. Blessed is the one. Can we pause here real quick? What does it mean to be blessed? What did you say, Charles? To have, God in your life. to have God in your life. What else does blessed mean? What's, a, what's another definition that you've heard of what it means to be blessed? It's like the last two weeks you may have heard it in, in a sermon. Uh, maybe. What, what's another definition of blessed? <laughs> God's given you so much material things, right? Okay. Yeah, but what? Okay, He's giving you life eternal. And that's part of the blessing. That's right. Some people think we're only blessed if we have material things. That's called prosperity gospel. Susan, what were you going to say? She said aligned, and that's what you said. Oh, yes, aligned. Being blessed is having that joy that comes with being aligned with God and God's purposes for you and others through Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be blessed. Alignment. Everyone say alignment. God, I said this this morning at the Revelation, so for the ladies who were there this morning, here's a redo. You're not, God's not going to bless you if you're not aligned with His will for you. You are created on purpose, for a purpose, and He's not going to bless you just because He's a genie in a bottle. He's not. You're blessed already because of the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to live and die for you. But then your continued blessings come with being aligned with that gift that He has given. Alignment. And one of the things we talked about this morning at the Revelation study is when you pray the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, when's the last time anybody prayed the Lord's Prayer? Sunday. Oh, great. Sunday. So <laughs> Sunday you prayed it, and one of the things you said is, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, friends, if you don't think that is an earth-shattering, kingdom-bringing prayer, where it's all about being aligned with God, you are too polite in your prayers. That's about alignment. That you, if you really pray that, your, your world's going to get shook. So, let me go back to Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Uh, verse 2, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in Him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Okay, what is it about that psalm that you see about confession? That it's good for the soul. It's good for the soul. Yeah. 
It's about alignment. And when I acknowledge my sin to you and do not cover it up, or do not cover my iniquity, what's a good definition of sin? Not being aligned with God. <laughs> not being aligned with God. That's right. Uh, the Greek the the Greek word for sin means to miss the mark, to not be in alignment. So uh, what what are so when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was in Matthew twenty two, uh, so a teacher of the law of of Moses came to me and said, "Hey, what's the greatest commandments? What's the greatest of all the commandments?" And Jesus said, "Well, first." Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor, others, as yourself. Okay, so if we just had that, and we were trying to figure out what sin was, we would have to go, okay, well, sin would probably be something that demonstrates that we aren't loving God. Now, what are things that demonstrate that we are loving God? Is it just saying, well, I'm a Christian because I've always been a Christian, and uh, I'm going to a Bible study, so uh, that means I'm pretty good. Is that loving God? That may be the first step for some folks. But, say it again. Obedience. obedience. Uh, loving God is obedience. It's also uh, trust. It's also being attentive. Uh, for those of you who've been married at some point, I, one of the things that you expect from the spouse who says that they love you is that they pay attention to you. Yeah, maybe. If they don't pay attention to you, then you you don't feel what? Love. love. So if a spouse or a loved one is saying, I love you, but they're never there for you, are they demonstrating love? No. Yeah, if, if they're saying, I, I love you, I love you, I love you, but their actions are demonstrating something different, then you got to go, I, you know, you're saying all the right words. I, I don't know if you if your heart's really behind it. Okay, love is more than just an emotion. Lord, love is an action. Okay, remember that next time you have a fight with your spouse, if you have one, you know, I love you, I love you. Okay, well, back it up. And the same thing with others. I just love people. I just love people. I love people. In fact, I, I had a premarital counseling session one time in Austin. <laughs> and and these, these were people on the outer edge of Christianity. They were a young couple. Uh, they were doing premarital counseling with me because uh, one set of parents was paying for the wedding. In order for them to pay it, they were obligated to go through premarital counseling. That was fun. All right. So, unwilling participants, that was great. So, one of the things the guy kept on saying is, I'm a very generous person. I'm a very generous person. Very generous. And at this point, I kind of had enough of him. I mean, it, it was clear that he was kind of talking a bunch. I said, so, uh, you're generous, right? And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. How much money did you give away to people in need last year? And he goes, oh, I didn't give any. And I said, I'm not even talking about church. I'm like, who, who have you given money to that's in need? I mean, you sound like a really generous person. Who's the last person you helped? And he goes, I, I, I don't know. And I said, when have, you, when have you volunteered to serve anybody? And he goes, oh, I haven't, I haven't done that. But I love people. He had an interesting idea about what love was. And I'm actually not sure if he and his wife are still married. Okay? So, so love, loving, loving God, if we're not loving God, then when we have times of confession, it's coming clean before the Lord and going, oh man, in these 30 seconds that I have for confession, you know, on Sunday mornings, you know, God, I, I have not loved you with all of my heart. And I'm here to confess that. And I know that. And I need your grace. And here are the ways that I recognize that I haven't loved you. And the same thing, I haven't really loved the people around me. They're driving me insane. And they're really on my last nerve, God. I'm not going to be honest with you on that. And my spouse is killing me. My kids are driving me crazy. And my family is nuts. And I, all I think about is the negative. But I know that's not honoring to you. And I need your help. That's confession. Okay? So when... When the priest is coming up to Walt, and Walt says, I'm not, I'm not going to confess, I appreciate his honesty. Because at least he's not going to go through the show. He's going to do it when he's ready. 
Okay, did I, did I keep someone from talking? I thought somebody had their hand up. Okay, and the last scripture is Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Is Romans in the Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament. Romans chapter 7 is after Romans chapter what? Six, yeah. I'm just making sure you're still with me. So Romans chapter 6, then 7. Who is writing the letter to the Romans? Paul. Here's Paul again. And is he writing to the general Roman population or is he writing to a specific group of Romans? The Christians in Rome. Did the Christians in Rome have an awesome church campus like we have? No, they, I mean, they, were, they were underground, right? Like, kind of like the Chinese church, if you know anything about them. They had to meet in secret, and it was not easy to be a Christian. You had to really step forward in faith to do that. So, Paul is talking about grace. Grace, 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 grace. He's talking about the sufficiency of Christ. He's talking about the sacrifice that Christ made for us. About the, but he's also talking about the power of sin and the, the, the war that wages within us. So, in Romans chapter... 7. He's talking about being torn one way or the other. And uh, it's kind of, uh, it's not too long. So starting with verse 7. Verse seven, seven. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7. 21, 21, 21. Oh, y'all want to just do, okay, that's cool. I mean, that's what I put, but that's all right. So I'm going to start with verse 7. So, And then we're going to end at 21 through 25. Yeah, so what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? I mean, it's like the, the law of Moses. Uh, does it trip us up or does it help us? So, certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. And what he means by that is it's like if you tell a kid, don't do something, what are they going to do? Yeah, don't watch that. Well, when you leave the room, they're going to watch it. So what he's saying is it's been clear that, that Certain things are bad. Coveting is bad. Well, okay, I didn't know coveting was bad, but now that it's bad, I kind of want to know. I want to know more about it. If that helps with this, what he's trying to describe here. Uh, okay, verse ten. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 13, Did that which is good then become death to me by no means? Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death. So, let me clarify that again. When the parents say, don't run across the street, it's meant to give life. But yet, I want so much, or as a kid, I want so much just to cross the street. I know my parents told me not to do it, I just want to cross the street, and sometimes bad things happen. But I wouldn't have known that I really wanted to run across the street until my parents said, don't run across the street. So would it have been better for them not to tell me? That's kind of the argument that he's making. Okay, So verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. Verse 16. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. 
So, this is where we pick up 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. I, I know it's right. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Uh, for example, I know that Jesus says to love others. And that includes my spouse and my family and my kids and my dysfunctional family. I know that's what I'm supposed to do and I know that's the right thing to do. But man, it's really hard and I don't really want to do it. Okay, that's the war that's waging within us. Verse 24, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then, I love this part. He asks the question, who's going to rescue him? He's a wretched man, who's going to rescue? And he answers, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And at that point, the rest of Romans changes. Because then he's talking about the solution, what it means for Jesus Christ to save the wretchedness in us. So when I look at the last scene that we showed there, I see that part of that is going on with Walt. He wants to do right. He's doing things that he knows he needs to do. At the same time, there's something waging within him where he's going to exact revenge on the people that have hurt his new friends. And he's going to do it in a way where he makes himself available to die so that uh, those people are taken to prison. Have y'all seen? Who's, who's, okay, so you've seen it. So in a way, he offers himself as a sacrifice on behalf, almost like the Christ does. Interesting. Yeah. So he's kind of come full circle on that. But I love this, this battle of the war that's going on within him because I think that's the story of Walt that we see in this movie. And I think what made this movie so good is that a lot of people could probably recognize that in themselves. I know I could. So, Okay. So, so there's your Bible teaching for not all from Grand Torino. Thank you, Clint Eastwood, for all that. Do you think Clint Eastwood had that in mind that there would be one day a Bible study class on his movie so that we could go deeper with him? Yeah, y'all need to write his fan club and tell him that uh, we're using him to go a little bit deeper on that. So here's some things to keep in mind for uh, next time on the slide that's coming up. Uh, remember the schedule. We don't meet next week. So don't come next week. But then we meet for the following two weeks, but not on the 16th, within the following two weeks. Uh, when, uh, as you leave, keep this thing in mind. Also, after the, this slide... About, about at the movies. Remember, we're not just talking about information. We're not just doing uh, film analysis. That's part of it. We're using it as a springboard to go deeper. We all like movies or we wouldn't be here. But how's this going to lead us to transformation? Stick with it. It's only six meetings and hey, you've gotten two under your belt for most of you. Come on. You get next week off. So if you have anything that you want to do, go do it next week so you can be here the following week. <laughs> Adjust your schedule accordingly, okay? I will send up an email uh, follow-up after class with info and an invitation to go deeper. If you were on the list last week but you didn't get that email, please make sure write it clearly on that sheet. We may have put it in wrong or we may just not have it. But on the, on the roster, we need you to check in anyway if you didn't. And then clearly write your email. That way we can get you the information. And if you didn't get the information last week, just write a note out there and I will forward you that email plus the other one. Uh, think about movies and scriptures and themes that you want us to dig into. I, I would love to hear. Some of you offered some comments. That's great. Uh, Bill Colstead brought A River Runs Through It. Uh, great movie. I haven't seen it in a while. So we might use that in a couple weeks. Uh, but really, if there's uh, someone mentioned chocolate, uh, chocolate, you know, last week, and uh, 28 Days was another movie that was brought up. Uh, but when you offer a movie, I've got to check on the availability either at Redbox or Netflix or Amazon. So if you have some obscure movie, ooh, help us out. If you got it, we'll, we'll watch it. Okay? If it can lead us deeper. And the, the prayer to pray during this whole time is come Holy Spirit. Can y'all pray that with me? No. Uh, that, that was pretty weak. All right, so come Holy Spirit. That is, once again, an earth-shattering prayer. Because if you really mean it, and you really want the Holy Spirit to come, He's going to rattle your cage. 
Okay? Be ready. And rather than your cage in a good way. One to get you aligned. Yes, sir? One example of rattling your cage. Yes. Just from your perspective. Oh, what's one example that I would say rattling your cage? Holy Spirit would rattle your cage. Uh, rattle my cage. Uh, I, just any once. If I, if I, uh, man, that's a great question, Charles. Uh, uh, to rattle, uh, I'll, I'll just be transparent because we've been talking about families. Okay, for me to pray, come Holy Spirit, <laughs> means that, uh, uh, I'll be honest with you, last night Michelle and I got on each other's nerves just a little bit. It had been a long day at the church. I was hot. I was tired. I'd spent a lot of time with people. I had used all my words for the day. Okay, I'm an introvert. I mean, I really am. I'm an introvert, and there's a number of words that once I get past that, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. And plus, I was, I was, it was just a long day. It was a good day, but it was a long day. So I got home, and Michelle didn't, she didn't respond in the way that I thought was really very gracious. And I took highly, I took high offense to it. I was like, well, what is the matter with you? You know, in a very loving way. You know, what is the matter with you? And in a loving way, she shot back, there's nothing the matter with me. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Come Holy Spirit is where I, if I'm praying that and I'm going, okay, come Holy Spirit. You can even transform this situation in my pettiness. And, and that actually happened last night after I went to bed. Because <laughs> I had the wisdom to just go to bed and not prolong it anymore. <laughs> Through experience and the power of the Holy Spirit. But really, it's those moments where you might feel justified to keep on doing something, but the Lord rattles your cage and goes, just shut up, just oh. just stop. Because for me, what that meant was more of a, a... It takes just a little bit... On my part, it takes a little bit of bravery to even ask the Holy Spirit to come in because I'm afraid what's going to be expected yeah. to be next. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's right. And, and you actually bring up a great point, Charles, because... But that's when you start taking faith seriously. Like you, I mean, not that we're not taking it seriously, but then when you go, Lord, I trust you, come Holy Spirit, then yeah, it is a little terrifying because you go, uh, uh, what does that mean? Like what, 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 what path is he going to take me on on this? That's like the scariest line in the Lord's Prayer is, Thy will be done. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you, if you really pray that, then you're on the lookout for it. Anyway, we'll continue that another time. Okay, so let's close in the final prayer. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Y'all are awesome. Thank y'all. Bye.